How's it going guys? So today we've travelled all the way up to southeast Queensland to visit my friend Joe. I'm going to check out his amazing reptiles. He has a bunch of blue tongues, monitors and a lot of rare little skinks. So you're going to love this. Stick around. As a kid, I grew up on a farm, uh, and it was, a, it was a cattle farm, and I um, basically showed no interest in the cattle. And uh, when, old, when the old man would be out in the paddock doing stuff, he'd sort of catch me uh, scurrying around in under the hedgerows and in the little ponds and stuff like that, just looking for anything creepy crawly that moved, whether it was insects, little mice, or frogs, or basically anything like that so I suppose it, it was a bug I was born with uh, and I've always been interested in the um, in the weird and the wacky as opposed to the conventional animals and and I, I would imagine to, to take that back and to pick what my first true love was it, it was the frog mm. yeah interesting um, and, and it sort of evolved from there lots of frogs in pommy land not many blue tongues yeah so um, <laughs> had to start with something I could find uh, and that's what it was and I think for most reptile keepers uh, and that's why it might be a bit controversial but um, the hands-off approach in Australia and not being able to touch reptiles I just think it's a lot of crap to be honest because all reptile keepers and enthusiasm comes from flipping rocks and mm. seeing what you can see so. so these are my outdoor monitor and skink setups here we've got four big aviaries basically uh, and they're, they're essentially split down the middle. They're six meters by three meters, each aviary is. This one is six by three meters, and this is just one aviary, but all the others are split down the middle. So each one has two separate compartments mm -hmm. in there. So, and they've got a hardwood base, and it's built up on rock on top of wire. So it's essentially nothing can borrow out of there. So we've got parentes. Yep. I've, I've historically kept all the big monitors, but of late I've sort of cut back a little bit as sort of I've gotten back into some skink species again and I, I've hung on to my Parenti project and I've sort of then gone on in some of these. I've actually got some carpets in one of them mm. and, I, and I've got land mullets, yakka skinks and you know just some of the more cooler species that I personally enjoy. Some of the big monitors I used to find all I was doing was throwing lots of food to them and yeah and, and really the only ones I was truly enjoying were the parenti so it was like just go with what you love and, yeah, mm -hmm. so that's where that's where I've landed now. Okay so we've got a male parenti here now I produced this guy he's three years old he's uh, produced his first clutch last season so he's not full size but he's sort of um, if you like he's he's like an 18 year old um, young pup that's just starting to hit the town so to speak very slender mm -hmm. pretty big but very 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 agile very dangerous animal actually on a hot day because he's not like one of the bigger slower critters he's actually very very quick and yeah if you if you try and when you're trying to feed him on a hot day he can be at this door and taking food off you before you even blink fortunately today it's a cooler day mm -hmm. and you can sort of preempt his movements but you can imagine on a 35 degree day you're probably actually better just leaving the door shut on yeah. a 35 <laughs> degree day because this guy if he thinks you've got food is um, a handful yeah awesome. actually you could say a handful you wouldn't even get your hands on him you wouldn't lay a glove on him he'd, 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 he'd get you Far and that's that's that. That's, that's why they're the king of the lizards in Australia. Yeah, yeah, and I believe when they're this sort of age that this is when they're probably at their most dangerous too because of that youthful mm. sort of energy and speed and so on and so forth. And still can be a bit skittish too because they're not quite sort of as sort of apex predator, not quite there yet like the big guys that let life pass them by, you know, where these guys still sort of think that you know, they, they could have a potential predator, so they're very quickly on the front foot. 
And um, yeah, this guy <laughs> is definitely on the front foot on a warm day. Oh. Okay, so in there I've got an adult pair of Yakka skigs. And there's a couple of blotches in there too. It's sort of cohabbed with a trio of blotches and a pair of yakka skinks, Igurnia major, which awesome. are from out at the Brigalow essentially, and they're an endangered species. So seeing these guys in captivity and they're now being successfully bred is is, is a win for the species, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a large skink too. Yeah. yeah. Got some size to them. Love these guys. I've got three baby parentis, there's two of them in here. I think this is a pair, you've got a male there and a female there. And um, you've just been introduced to dad over there. So um, yeah, these guys hatched in August last year. So they're just pressing on towards six months of age and just starting to eat sort of um, wiener rats. I also chop up day old chickens for them. As you can see, they've got three by three meters here and sort of plenty of space to bomb around. Awesome. For me, how'd you beat that? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, you know, that's reptile keeping, isn't it? They're just right, such right, pretty monitors right too. Right there, you know? So pretty. That is literally why I do it when you look at that. Yeah. You know? It's just, just to see that. And Mama lives in here on a, on, on deeper substrate, so when, when she's had her male introductions, she's got a good deep substrate to, to lay eggs. So she's, um, she's pretty placid, this girl. She, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> as you can see, she, I can actually pick her up. She's puppy dog tame. She's mm -hmm. just huffing and hissing because that's what she does. But um, that's that's what goannas do, I suppose. Yeah. But she she'd sit on your shoulder and um, yeah, she's pretty. She's just going through a shed at the moment. Underneath all this, we'll get a nice pretty lady again eventually. But <laughs> just at the moment, you shedding out the old clothes, aren't you, love? Yeah. Okay, so I've got land mullets in here. They're quite elusive, as you can see. I don't know whether we're going to see any, but um, what, I, what I've done is set up a sort of uh, a terrain for them that holds plenty of water. These guys like like the like the rain and a bit of a tropical environment. Mm. If you if you go say down to the Gold Coast hinterland and look in the rainforests, you'll find these mm -hmm. guys. And that was sort of my thought process here. A nice deep mulch that holds some humidity, uh, hollow logs. And then um, some of these guys here, which as you can see, hold a little bit of water in there. Yeah, the bromeliads. Yeah, yeah, the bromeliads. I've forgotten the name then. It's, um, and, and they actually get up the mullets do and have a little drink out of the, the, right. the water pockets that nice. are in the bromeliads. And I've also got a sprinkler here and I'll just give it a bit, mm -hmm. of, a, bit of a blast. Awesome. Um, it'd be nice if we could see one. So Joe's also got some snakes outside, which is really cool to see. Yeah, these are some of my um, carpet projects that have sort of evolved over the years. These are mixed blood projects with some of the mutation genetics in there. And this is a nice big female here that, um, yeah, happily bite you. Bite yeah. you, darling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So she's 50% bread lie. Yeah, pet nice. albino. And Beautiful. there's four at the there's another one coming in. <laughs> Usually when I come out here, I've got food for them, so... Um, yeah, they're used to it. <laughs> they're used to it, but as you can see by the condition of them, they're not underfed mm. either. It's so, cool to see them use all the space. Yeah. Again, Beautiful. same thing, that was, you know, moving out here and having some space, I, I wanted to sort of have it, really have a think about what I wanted to do and what I wanted to keep and set things up that really, really utilized and enjoyed the space yeah rather than stuff that really didn't do well in captivity stuff that just seems to thrive in the space that you give it you know Perfect. and these guys definitely thrive in here don't you hey okay so raining today you're not going to see many animals in my blue cages but in a way it's a good thing because it gets to show you how how they really work i mean we've had days and days of rain and as you can see just there's no rain settled on these cages at all because the way I set it up, these oh, oh, they're shade sails, but they also double purpose into um, rain relief. The rain just lands on them, mm -hmm. and runs away, and then on hot days, I have these covers back and these still on, so they actually reflect sunlight too. And then on the cooler days when it's nice and sunny, I just pull the lot off. 
Perfect. A little bit labour intensive, but enables me to keep stuff outside all year round. Mm -hmm. And with the Australian extremes, mm -hmm. I can keep animals in these all year round with without any dramas at all, as long as I manage these tarps yep. effectively. So, um, we will just have a look at a couple of critters. So, what are you keeping outdoors at the moment? What goes well out here? Uh, all my blueies at different times mm -hmm. what can stand a bit of time oh, some outside. So. <laughs> Oh, Some geckos on there. Gecko on there. And then, but my blotch is all year round, so this is one that you're Whew. particularly uh, yep. interested in. This guy's in slough, so that's a super pinstripe. Beautiful. Blotchy. And um, next to it there, that's his mother there, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know Cooper Lee's awesome. your favourite, yep. that's why I went for these cages <laughs> just to show you a couple of blotches. So we've got that one there, and then in, in here, We've got oh, there you go. the example blotchy. And um, this is everyone's, a lot, a lot of people love this one at the moment. That thing is insane. Yeah, I just managed to get this replicated properly this year. Yeah. So I've got a small handful of these now. And like any good reptile, Madam has <laughs> yep. pooped in her water. Classic. There we go. Mine seem to push their food into their water bowl. I don't even know how they get it in yeah. there. It's insane. Yeah, that's awesome. But yeah, that's that's her. So that's um, blotchy mutations in about one minute, basically. There are two <laughs> blotchy mutations that exist, both proven. You've got super pinstripe and black-eyed exanthic there. Okay, so let's go and have a look in the reptile room uh, and how I've sort of got a set, got it set up. It's a bit of a crypt, if you like. It's it's sort of well packed in there, but uh, as it's underneath the top level of the house. It sort of uh, solved all my thermal issues of when I used to have it in a big tin shed. So on hot days, it stays nice and cool down here. And on um, cold days, it, it, it stays retains warmer, the yeah. heat. So my um, ambient temperatures change from this sort of range down to this. And yeah. as any successful breeder, reptile breeder will tell you, mm -hmm. if you can keep your ambient temperatures in a, a, a narrow bandwidth, you are more than... Mm halfway there yeah makes it much yeah. easier to manage yeah, yeah of course so, all right um, yeah so it, it, it as with m m most sort of serious reptile keepers that are breeding morphs and so on it's a bit of a it's a bit of a rack central well we've got a, a bank of enclosures mm -hmm. along here which has got sort of more carpets and some skink species in and then we sort of got the engine room of all my blue tongue adults mm -hmm. um, in these racks now these guys will spend typically half their time in racks and half their time outside awesome and I, I, I actually think that that's probably the key to a lot of my success is that my animals all get to go outside as to what you see whether it's snakes lizards or, or, or whatever Mm. Uh, um, they all get to go outside and I think you know they, these animals have evolved outside and uh, I just don't think there's an argument to suggest that UV and etc yeah. uh, and outdoor conditions doesn't help these animals which it, it, it actually clearly does. Got some skink species here we've got a couple more yakka skinks I was hoping this girl down here might have a couple of babies in her but doesn't seem to have done much yet she was mated but yeah so I just got her under observation mm -hmm. we've got a couple of grow out yakas here and then up top we have albino tree skinks oh beautiful so you've been up you've been working with these for a long time now yeah hey? I, I picked up the original project mm. um um there was sort of three or four animals in the original project and i actually got got it going so to speak outbred it got it going made it consumer friendly yeah, I've seen a lot yeah. of people producing and them now, now. Now there's a few out yeah. there, yeah. Um, Becoming more common. Yeah. It's good to see. Another unique skink project here, uh, and this is the one and only Albino Cunningham skink. Oh, I was hoping to see this. <laughs> and, um, okay, so, that's it. Wherever she is, she'll be in here somewhere, I'll find her. There she is. Oh, there. wow. It's a darker form of albino. She's got cherry red eyes. Uh, it's sort of in line with what's described 
when I match the mutation to something that exists in other reptiles, it sort of fits the description of a caramel albino. Yeah, well, as you can see, the contrast to its yeah. uh, to its sibling there. Um, you know, it clearly is an albino, but I don't know whether it, I don't think it's a classic T negative albino. I think it sort of sits more towards the caramel or T plus side of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely darker than a typical albino. Yeah, right but obviously there's only one, so yeah. we don't know yet exactly. You know, once three or four are out, you're going to get a, a better idea of the polygenic range. So Yeah. Um, and that project's well and truly underway. You've got three of her babies in here. I've just changed this mulch, that's why it's, there's a bit of humidity trapped mm -hmm. in the cage. I just put fresh mulch down the other day for them. There is, um, oh, uh, yeah, you see, yep, <laughs> yeah, there you go. So they're 100% het, uh, for her, if yep. you like. So they're three of her babies from last year, exciting. So they're yearlings, and then she had, um, three more babies if we just chopped through into here. Um, we've got three more from her here, so the project, whilst we haven't got any more albinos yet, we've got plenty of yeah. material to 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 sort of um yep. to get get this project on the it's it, to get this project on the road so to speak nice so might want to get in close on these and mm -hmm. see something we've got um night skinks here oh wow so leophilus striata there's a baby oh, there wow. so there if you can just zoom in on yep. that that's so a, that's a baby that's adorable Beautiful skinks they are. Yeah, really love these guys. Um, and I would say, yep. there we go. He often sits under there. There's dad. Awesome. And mum usually sits under there. <laughs> it's funny how they find it's, their own Yeah, spots I, I always know where they are, it seems to be. And the, and the baby seems to take his residence in there. And they, yeah. Of Agurnium McPhee Oh, so, yeah. as you can feel in the cages, oh, they're yeah. very hot. I, I'm a big believer in keeping reptiles hot. Mm. I keep them hot. Yeah, you want to see that activity? Yeah, spike. yeah, yeah. You know, and, and and when you keep animals outside too, you realise just how warm they get. And yeah, you, you you literally are given an example of how you need to keep animals. You know. And that's what I decided I wanted to do. I wanted to really focus on my skinks again. You know, with that Albino Cunningham project, I really want to give that some depth, you know, and yeah. hang on to stuff. So, um, you just build, build and build and build. So, mm -hmm. Yakka skinks, Cunningham skinks, land mullets, blotchies, and yeah. all my blues. At the end of the day, that's what I always loved. I've always liked playing with monitors too, yeah. but when it comes to it, I'd soon have something like an Igurnium McPhee there than, than an Emerald Tree Monitor. Yeah. Believe it or not. Yeah. That's probably pretty controversial to some is, people, but... but <laughs> I look at I do, I do it because I love it. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether it's 100 bucks or, or 30k at mm -hmm. the end of the day. I keep yep. it because I like it. We've got the third baby Parenti there. Um, I like to keep one inside. It's my little buddy, this one. <laughs> okay, so... um. I know we don't have much time, but I'm, I'm going to just give you a, a, a little rundown on some morph stuff. So, some morph blueies, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, here, and, and we're going to look at some of the stuff I've produced this year. So, um, this is a moon glow. So, this is visual white northern, visual albino, and visual amory. So, wow. um, yeah, that's basically a flash white albino. Amazing. And then when you compare it to the to the opposite, your hypermelanistic albino, your larva here, um, yeah, you can see it. So that your larva is obviously your albino plus hypermelanistic, and they're your two extremes yeah. that you can sort of aim for with albino, albino anything really, yeah. high orange or, or high white. Yeah, and I, I don't think you'll get a better example of that contrast in albinism. Yeah. Than, than those two critters there. A couple yeah, of projects yeah. that are sort of still in their infancy in Australia. We just started to release a few of these guys. You've got your T, T plus albino here. 
So this is a, a softer form of albinism. It doesn't have your red eyes, but what it does do, it takes away all the black pigment. Well, it doesn't actually take it away. It denatures it and mm -hmm. leaves sort of a, a lilac-y, um, lavender-y hues where the black should be. Personal yeah. favourite of mine. I, yeah. I like, as I said to you before, I like the softer, more subtle mutations as opposed to some of the more extreme stuff. Some of this stuff seems to retain more of the wild type yeah. features for me and it sort of hits a nice balance. Yeah. Beautiful. I keep the stuff pretty simply, you know, when it comes to the babies. Easy to clean, newspaper, yep. plenty of stuff for them to get underneath. Um, I can see what's going on, I get to see what the poop looks like. <laughs> and that's that's pretty important, any any decent animal keeper is not scared of a bit of poop. Yep. And if you've got them on too much sawdust or, or too much loose um, uh, substrate, you know, you're not going to be able to keep track of that. Here's a project here that I'm fortunate, was fortunate enough to pick up sort of um, 12 months ago. I haven't had any breeding success with them yet, but um, they're sort of reaching adulthood. It's going to be a bit of a challenge because anything outside of its range mm -hmm. um, is always hard to do. So, and, and obviously we're not in western range here, so we've got a pair of these guys here. Um, wow. And they're, they're very much a reduced, um, I call them the white westerns. So the actual best example of them is actually outside. I forgot to to look at that while we're out there but yeah that that one there gives you a damn good idea of how you know these guys are yeah, virtually wow. yeah and so and that's a pair that's probably the biggest most robust pair so that actually holds the um, yep. the key for me the the, the, the most visual animal is a, mm. it's a small animal and quite often the case with mutations they they need a bit of work yeah and I think if this project is going to be replicated it's going to come from from this fella here Okay, so we just saw Mom out there, um, the Exanthic blotchy outside there, and I was fortunate enough to get this project replicated this year. Um, for a reason I'm not sure yet, I don't know why these guys ain't as white as Mum, mm. but we've certainly replicated the Exanthism. Uh, as you can see, we've got black eyes and we've got no orange or yellow pigment, mm -hmm. which is punctuated when you look at the heterozygous sibling. You can see that orange in the eye there. Yep. Uh, and the more standard lowland blotchy coloration through that animal. So, um, still a, an ongoing project, but very much alive and yeah. kicking. And who knows how they'll look as they yeah, shed out and grow older? You yeah, know? and the opportunity to mix these in with the the pinstripe, yeah, and so on to give um, a double representation of the mutations. Well. Um, That'll be awesome. Is, is, is exciting stuff. This is a project that I've had for a few years from a, 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 a New South Wales wild type patternless phenotypic animal, and I was fortunate enough to pair that to what I believe to be an exanthic project, uh, and and put both mutations together, if you like, early on. So um, a pure eastern project, and the patternless proved out to look like that which is basically a, a green in color oh, patternless yeah. animal. And then when you put the exanthic overlay on the top, you've got patternless with black eyes. And honestly, it, you, I mean, you can see these yeah. with your own eyes. These, these are as good as anything out yeah. there, I reckon. They're Visually, incredible. You know, that, that exanthic super form of that. And it, it turned out to be an incomplete dominant mutation nice. in the sense that you've got visual hets. Mm. And Just like the hypermelanistics. Yeah, and, and your blotches, yeah. your super pinstripe blotches. It's basically the same mutation as the blotches. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And the blueies when you, when you look at it. Incomplete dominant mutation. What I mean by that is at a, at a single copy level or a heterozygous level, you've got this guy, which is a breaking of the patterning. As you can see, it's totally different from the normal yeah. wild type in the sense that all the pattern's broken. And then once you get two copies or the homozygous situation, you've got a, 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 t a totally different change again. You know, it's it's what you would class as patternless. Wow. Yeah, and as stunning. you can see, these are these are stonkers. Yeah. You've got some, some solid FNQ yeah. <laughs> blood in there. And um, yeah, they're every bit as big and as more impressive than northerns. Yeah. To me, that um, a lot of people don't recognise it as such, but that doesn't really bother me because mm. I do. I see this as the, you know, the the apex of bluey morphs at the moment. Mm. 
That's awesome. not only do you get some great colours, you get size, you get pattern, yeah. you just get everything. And the, the, the potential of these, we've already done it in Exantic, as you just saw, you wait till you see a big patternless albino like that. Yeah, that's going to look you know, amazing. Or a, a yeah, or a patternless T+. Plus. Okay, so this is something that's um, popped out of my T Plus projects. And at first I thought, you know, maybe it is something to do with the T Plus, but I managed to single it out by itself. So here you've got a T Plus version of it, but here you've actually got um, a wild type version of the mutation, if you like, a mutation by itself that's not influenced by any other mutation. So um, what you've got is you've got a stripping of the pigment on the snout almost sort of like a dare I say it but I, I'm not claiming that it is it's got a little bit of a pied appearance on mm. the head you've got a pink tongue you've got pink feet all the pattern stripped out of the legs and feet and off the belly and then you're left with like a, a perfect stripe down the back yep so crazy um, uh, yeah and there's the T plus version of it and it also disrupts the pattern on the second half of the tail so um, still in its infancy. Again, yeah. I don't really wish to name it. To be honest, I just it's just something that I found that I can replicate, and it'll be interesting to see the capability of it yeah. when um, uh, played with a bit further uh, and mixed into other mutations and so on. So that's um, awesome, exciting. One of my favourites. So here's some other newish blue tongues you haven't really seen before. This is a blackout, so it's a hypermelanistic and a black-eyed anery. As you can see, it has no orange pigment under the belly there, like you would normally get on a hyper. And then this is a T plus combined with a white northern. And wow, this thing shines, absolutely glows. What a beautiful animal in there. Complete opposites, black and pearl white. So, um, most people know me as the bluey guy, I know, but I've always had a, a, a strong interest in, in, in morph carpet pythons and. Uh, a, sp a particular project of mine that I wanted to sort of try and achieve was to try and match the intensity of orange mm -hmm. in a carpet python uh, to that which I sort of already achieved with your lava blue tongue. And what I did was I got a, a hypermelanistic bread lie, not a, a, a classic mutation itself, but basically just a really dark bread lie, and um, paired it to an albino uh, to see if I could. Um, pull out some of those orange colours that you can see are so strong in a lava blue tongue and I think you can see with this girl here, this, this animal's a year old, produced it last year, you can see that we're basically there. Yeah. And um, those carpets that you could see being kept outside, they're sort of the, 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 the parent het material to mm. this if you like. And um, Personally, although I'm biased, <laughs> I think that's the prettiest carpet python in the game. At the yeah, moment. that thing is off its head and it's stunning. The camera won't get it either, it's so vibrant. That's why I thought I'd put it next to a lava because it just yeah. shows you, you know, you, it's know glowing. How, you know how everybody goes nuts for lavas. Well, mm -hmm. you know, there's your carpet. <laughs> colour is just as good. matches the colour. Slightly different way of getting there, but yeah. at the end of the day, uh, phenotypically, it, it is exactly the same. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I suddenly got into birds. It was something that I, I've always wanted to do, and I always lived in suburbia, basically, and never really had the chance, as these guys are pretty damn noisy, and your neighbours will hate on you pretty quick if yeah. you've got noisy macaws carrying on at 5 a.m. So, um, now I've got this bit of property in a big shed that I can put these guys in. Um, I had the opportunity to do it. And what we've got here is, this is a Latino macaw. So that's your normal blue and gold macaw there. And then this is your Latino. So like albinism in, in reptiles, this is a recessive mutation. Um, and um, yeah, so you need both parents to either, either display or carry the genetics to produce mm -hmm. your opal in here. So this is teeny weeny. <laughs> this is a, a, a Latina cockbird and this is Tuki and she's uh, ahead. And um, what my design in these cages enable you to do is at night I shut them off so they're nice and safe, but in the daytime wow. they have these 
awesome flights that they can yeah. swoop out into and, and come back again. So these guys basically live the yeah. life of Riley, so to speak. Yeah. But today, because we've got torrential rains, and I had them out yesterday in the rains, I just decided to keep them in. Yep. So, there you have it. I love it, such a good simple design too, like it's easy to do and works amazing, hey. Oh, yeah. yeah, well it, it seems to have worked so far, so. <laughs> and these guys are happy, aren't you mate, hey? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Cooper, so what we've got here is we've got a, a blue and gold macaw mutation. And um, these are still quite rare around the world and in Australia, it's, it's, it's called opaline. So there's your opaline there. And as you can see, it's a bright yellow bird compared to your normal blue and gold macaw, which is there. And um, what that is, that's a sex link mutation, different to what you see in reptiles, whereby all you actually need to make an opaline macaw is a male that carries the genetics. Yeah, right. So if you have a male that carries the genetics and put it over a, a normal hen, you'll get an opaline female. But then to make an opaline male, you actually have to have a male that carries the genetics over a visual female. So if you like, she's a visual pet. Yeah. But in the bird game, it's quite common in, 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 Lutino, in the Lutino genetics, etc. And, and it's, it's been sort of deduced that it's sex land. Yeah, wow. Hey that guys. is a beautiful animal. And you love your nuts, don't you? Hey? <laughs> Not a big fan of strangers though. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, okay, so that's me guys. You got to see the reptiles, the, um, the snakes, the lizards, and the new additions there, the birds. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching guys. Make sure you like and subscribe for more Keepers Collections episodes and I'll see you next time.